So at this point, we should have a pretty good grasp of the basic components that are involved in an argument, so the premises, the conclusions, and the inferential move between the premises and the conclusion. And uh, we should have a pretty good idea about what truth preservation is, and that's insofar as we're learning to analyze arguments, that's what we're most focused on is whether arguments are truth preserving. And we've studied those, uh, the notion of truth preservation in more detail with respect to deductive arguments on one side and inductive arguments on another side. Um, and we've even spent a little bit of time mapping out arguments so we get a sense of structure that, that many arguments come with a particular structure and the structure matters. There are other challenges that can face us though when analyzing arguments. Um, <clears throat> and one of those challenges can be the uh, meaning of the terms that are involved in the argument. So, for instance, um, there are two linguistic functions. There's actually many functions that we have for language. But two, uh, here's two of them. One is to convey information, so to state a fact. As to say the world is round, for instance. The other is to um, evoke or express emotion. So I might call uh, someone stubborn, for instance. And uh, not only does that convey potentially a fact or information, but stubborn has, as we all know, a negative connotation to it. So it elicits this sort of emotional response. And it turns out that um, part of being a human being is we, we respond to those emotional um, connotations that sentences or words can have, and we can be persuaded by that as opposed to the facts, and that gets in the way of our deliberating process. So what we're going to do in this video is we're going to explore that in a little bit more detail, and then towards the end we'll also um, talk about a, a couple of other ways that language can, the language that's used in an argument can um, interfere with our ability to analyze it, and that has to do with vagueness and ambiguity. All right, so let's turn our attention to um, cognitive and emotive meaning. Now, so the cognitive meaning of a sentence or of a statement is the information that the sentence conveys. And here we mean the, the kind of information that could be true or false. So uh, factual information or information that purports to be a fact. Maybe it, it turns out to be false, so it wouldn't technically be a fact. So uh, one example of this would be the Empire State Building is 102 stories tall. That's either true or false. There's not really a whole lot of emotional um, baggage that's attached to that sentence. So the primary meaning that is taking place in that statement is cognitive. It's cognitive meaning. And in that case, um, it's true. The Empire State Building is 102 stories tall. But um, even false sentences like the moon is made of blue cheese, the primary meaning of that is still going to be cognitive meaning. Um, and just for the, the reason that there's really not a whole lot of emotive baggage, the information that's, that you're, is being conveyed there is one that could be true or false. It's trying to tell you that it's a fact that the moon is made of blue cheese, but it's not. In contrast to the cognitive meaning, we have the emotive meaning or emotive force of a statement or sentence. And the emotive meaning is the emotion that the sentence expresses or tends to elicit. So sometimes when we uh, make a statement, we're trying to express some sort of sentiment that we have, or because of the words that we choose to use, it elicits a certain emotive response in the listener or the, the person who reads the, the statement. So we can look at a couple of examples here. Um, example A, liberals are naive youth who aspire to some utopian fantasy that can't possibly be realized. Uh, so to maintain that liberals are naive youths, to call someone a naive youth is a derogatory thing. So that's got this negative connotation already built into it. So we're, we're already intimating that liberals are bad in some way. 
Uh, and then we, we see that they aspire to some utopian fantasy. Again, to call this what liberals want to, um, the agenda that they want to get through, to call that a fantasy is derogatory. So again, um, we've got this a negative emotive aspect to this statement. And then we're told that the, the, um, this fantasy can't possibly be realized. What the liberals want to get done can't possibly be realized. All right, so uh, being an equal opportunist, opportunist let's, uh, let's see what we can say about conservatives. So conservatives are uncompassionate morons who would rather let children starve than be taxed. Clearly calling somebody an, un an uncompassionate moron is a negative thing. So there's this... Um, a negative connotation uh, we're in the background of this we're being told it's being intimated that conservatives are uh, are bad in some respect in fact we go on to to maintain that they would rather let children starve than be taxed and of course that uh, would evoke negative emotions because we tend to prize children as as uh, you know a, a treasure that we need to do whatever we can to make to ensure their safety and the the important part or the important reason for bringing up a mode of meaning is that when we use a mode of meaning it it can steamroll us it can carry us over to a conclusion without much critical reflection or it can it can prevent us it can be a way of dismissing um, uh, taking the time to even consider another position um, and any of the points that somebody might take who has a different view than you. So for instance, you might imagine either of these passages, you might imagine someone who you respected saying them to you when you were a child before you even had um, the ability to cognitive, to, uh, to reflect critically, to have the cognitive capacity to re to reflect critically and as a young child you'll get the message you know in example a that liberals are bad and in example b that conservatives are bad and um, since you don't have those critical capacities yet it's very likely that you'll then make the conclusion or adopt the position that they are in fact bad that liberals or conservatives whatever the situation might be that they are bad and of course that's not a good argument. There's not a truth-preserving argument there. Just because you have the emotion, the emotional attachment that such and such is a bad thing, it doesn't thereby follow that it is. That that's true that it's bad. Um, so that's one way, that's just one example of um, how emotive meaning can lead us astray, or at least lead us to a conclusion that, that we're not justified in, in maintaining. Um, but it can also prevent us. So, so maybe you've done some research at some point, and you ended up deciding that uh, you know you're you lean left, so you're a liberal. It's very easy then for once you adopt that and you internalize that, and you it's, you take it as part of your personal identity, right? It's it's uh, psychologically incorporated in you. Um, and you'll now that I mention this, you'll see people do this all the time. It's very easy then to slander the opposing, whatever the opposing views are in this case would be conservatives, um, and be in a very dismissive way. So if it turns out that conserv that if conservatives are uncompassionate morons, then I don't have to take them seriously, right? I they're. I already know that they're bad and I don't really have to do a whole lot of thinking. I don't have to take the hard work of thinking about the positions that have led people to the conservative views as opposed to liberal views. Um, so that's a way of preventing me from having, from being open-minded really and making sure that I am, I'm coming to my conclusions based solely on information and that when new information is brought to me, I'm not just completely dismissive of it. So we have to be aware of a mode of meaning, and not only do we need to be aware of it, but insofar as we want to be um, 
better at analyzing arguments, we need to be able to disengage the emotive meaning because it doesn't have anything to do with truth, and we want to leave the cognitive meaning behind. Um, and that way we can just evaluate the cognitive meaning without the, the emotive meaning. Now in the previous examples, it's not like the only thing that was being communicated through um, the language being used was emotional. It, there's in fact both cognitive meaning and emotive meaning. So as I was saying, we need to be able to disengage the emotive meaning from that. So let's see what that might look like if we sit down with the previous examples and we remove the emotive language and we try to leave uh, what else was being conveyed. So looking at example A, that would turn into all liberals are young because we said they were youths and have little life experience because we said they were naive, right? That's the more literal meaning of na uh, naivety, naivety. So all liberals are young and have little life experience. As a result, they try to bring about a state of affairs that is impossible to bring about. Well, notice once we remove the emotive meaning, um, it's much clearer that, that this is um, not charitable to liberals. It's just not true that all liberals are young and have little life experience. There are um, older uh, people who are still liberals. So you have a false premise, right? And then we're told that they try to bring about a state of affairs that is impossible to bring about. Um, and we should wonder whether that's really true or even if it's fully impossible, right? If you have some sort of utopian um, ideal that you would like to bring about, even if it's impossible to bring that about, you still might wonder, well, isn't getting close, as close as possible, still a good thing? Um, and this person isn't taking that into account, isn't taking that into consideration. The person who's saying um, these statements, that is. So now let's look at our other example with respect to the conservatives. So if we take the, the emotional meaning out of it, we get no conservative cares for another person and all conservatives have less than an average intelligence. That's just clearly false, right? It's um, clearly there are conservatives who have higher than, uh, at least average intelligence and higher. And um, surely there's conservatives uh, who care for another person. You probably know some. And so um, once we take that emotional meaning out of it, it becomes clear like that's just false, right? You're just saying a false thing. Uh, and then you have as a result, they don't support taxes that would save um, children's lives. Well, um, even if it is the positions that they don't support taxes, uh, we haven't given a, a charitable reading for conservatives because we haven't uh, really considered the the reasons, right? The reasons that they would appeal to to have that kind of position. So, in, notice in either case, it, it becomes much clearer that the argument that was suggested by these passages, uh, they're very weak. They're very weak arguments, and they're they're just not good arguments. And when you put that emotional meaning back into it it disguises that, it disguises that uh, um, that these are in fact weak arguments and it makes it feel, because the emotions that are associated with them are strong, it makes it feel like they're stronger arguments. Not only that, but when you, when you include the emotional meaning, it's also a way to shut down arguments. Um, you know, if you're not a very confrontational person, and somebody said, makes a statement that really has a whole lot of heated um, emotional language involved with it, you might just turn away, you know, just back down. And that'll make that person think that they've won or that they have a good argument um, because nobody, nobody would uh, challenge it. But of course, the, the fact that nobody challenges an argument doesn't make it a good argument. What makes it a good argument is whether it's truth-preserving or not. 
let's take a, another look at how uh, using different words and the different emotive connotations that are wrapped up with them can have different psychological impacts on us. So if, if somebody were to tell you that so-and-so is firm, so I am firm, that has a positive notion to it. Right? So someone who, and what we're saying when we say I'm firm is, I'm, I'm not gonna change my mind very easily, something to that effect. So I am firm, but to state that as I am firm suggests that you're steadfast. That's, you know, it has all these, these positive aspects to it. Um, but you can describe that very same situation correctly by saying that the person is obstinate. Again, you don't change your mind very easily if, if we strip away the emotive aspect to it. But now it has a negative connotation to it. To be obstinate as opposed to being firm, being obstinate sounds like it's a bad thing. And so then you might, have, you might develop a bad opinion of somebody if you're told that she's obstinate as opposed to being firm. Um, or you might find out that a person, or you might cash it out in terms of pig-headed fool, right? You might say the person is a pig-headed fool. And clearly now when you're calling somebody pig-headed and when you're calling them a fool, even if what you're saying is that person's not gonna change, that person's not gonna change their mind very easily, that's very negative. That's got a very negative connotation to it. And if described that way, your attitude towards that person is gonna be a lot different. Or um, somebody who does change their mind, right, we can say, we can cash that out in different types of emotive language. So I have considered it, or I have reconsidered it, rather. That suggests somebody's thoughtful, right, to reconsider. And we generally think being thoughtful is a good thing. So re reconsidering things or reevaluating things, there's this positive connotation that goes along with it. Or somebody says you've changed your mind. That's really kind of neutral for the most part. It doesn't have a whole lot of emotive um, baggage that's attached to it. Um, or right, we'll say this to pay, about politicians who change their position. This person's flip-flopped. And we're saying this person's changed his or her mind, but now that has a negative connotation to it. Shows uh, something like a lack of principle. Right? Includes that. So here's, here's ac potentially accurate ways to describe the very same situations, yet based on what word we choose, it's going to have the different emotional impact. And as a result, and it's going to change the types of conclusions that we normally draw, but they really shouldn't, right? If we just say it in the neutral way, and evaluate it in the neutral way, that's what we should try to draw our conclusions from. As I've been saying, we wanna be able to pull these two types of meanings uh, apart from each other. So we wanna be able to take the emotive language out and we wanna leave the cognitive meaning behind. And that's because the cogn cognitive meaning is what we're really interested in in so far as we're analyzing arguments in so far as we're worried about the truth, right? Emotional, the emotional aspect of things, not the kind of thing that can be true or false. It's the cognitive information. That's the type of information that can be true or false in the statements. Um, and of course, as, as I've been suggesting, emotive language interferes with our judgment about whether an argument is a good argument or a bad argument. And it has the effect of psychologically persuading us into accepting um, unpersuasive arguments as being persuasive, objectively unpersuasive arguments as being subjectively persuasive. And um, what I wanna do then is look at a couple more examples where, uh, where we start off with a statement that has the emotional language built into it and then we and it's an argument and then we want to look at uh, what that argument looks like once we remove that emotive language
All right, let's look at the following argument that has some emotive language built into it. If we harvest the organs of certain animals, such as baboons, and transplant the organs into humans who need them, many human lives will be saved. Therefore, we ought to harvest the organs of baboons and use these organs to save humans' lives. So why don't you go ahead and pause the video and write out what you think this statement looks like without the emotive language. So try to pull that emotive language out, leaving it just with the cognitive meaning, the neutral cognitive meaning, and uh, compare it to um, what, I'll, what I'll suggest is the um, neutral cognitive meaning that should be left behind. Alright, so when I strip out the emotive language, I end up with the following passage. If we remove the vital organs of certain kinds of animals, such as baboons, and transplant them in hum into humans who need them, the animals will die, but many human lives will be saved. So we ought to remove the vital organs of baboons and use the organs to save human lives. So notice that previously we were talking about harvesting the organs. Let's go back. So we said, if we harvest organs of certain animals such as baboons and transplant the organs into humans who need them, many human lives will be saved. Therefore, we ought to harvest. Well, harvest um, has built into it this connotation of what our farmers do. Um, and our farmers you know, take a lot of time and energy of sowing uh, certain seeds, um, making sure to tend to the fields until they've matured, then to reap what they sow, to, to get the fruits of their labor. So it has this very positive sort of connotation to it. And in this case, what that does is it, it um, covers up the fact that what we're doing is we're removing vital organs and so while, we'll, while transplanting them will save human lives, it ignores the fact that the animal is going to die. And while you still might think that this is a good argument, right? even with this additional information that the baboons are going to die, um, if we add that human lives are more valuable or something to that effect, you might really think that this is still a good reason to get to the conclusion, but it is some, the fact that, that the baboon is going to die, that these are, if it doesn't have these vital organs, um, and, you know, if, if the baboons have somewhat good lives worth living, even if they're not as more important than human lives, that's at least some countervailing evidence to the contrary. And as a result, is important information to be considering um, when deciding whether we should be uh, uh, transplanting organs from baboons into human beings. So, um, so when we put it in the, in the more neutral language, it allows us to take into account the, the vital, uh, vital, the relevant and significant facts when deciding whether the conclusion does in fact follow from the premises. Let's look at it, um, another passage. All right, so in this statement, we have, ever since Franklin D. Roosevelt introduced welfare programs into American life, this country has become increasingly socialistic. But Americans reject socialism. So the sooner we eliminate welfare, the better. Let's go ahead and pause the video. Uh, try removing the emotive language out of this passage and then compare what you have with what I ended up with. All right, so here's the um, cognitive meaning that's left over when we take out the emotive meaning. So it says, since the introduction of welfare programs, this country has added many programs that are run by the federal government. So notice that well, I'm replacing socialism and socialistic with um, programs that are run by the federal government. <clears throat> and you might it, it, it turns out that you might be confused by that. Um, so know that 
that uh, socialism and the term socialism and socialistic has had a negative connotation for Americans for, for a very long time. Um, I've seen that with the new generation coming up that the word doesn't have, doesn't seem to carry the same negative connotations or at least not to the same degree. Um, so maybe you were confused by, by this example, but uh, traditionally um, socialism has had this negative connotation to it. So <clears throat> that's why I, um, so that's why I decided to remove that and replace it with programs that are run by the federal government. Um, Americans are opposed to a situation in which many programs are run by the federal government, so we should eliminate wel welfare programs. So caching it this way allows us to assess the argument better because it takes away the negative connotation of socialism. Um, it's relatively clear that, that Americans want the federal government to run some programs. Um, just how many, though, is is uh, one of the things that we would often debate about. Um, so that, uh, that allows us to assess this argument with a clear head. So we've been talking about emotive meaning and cognitive meaning and disengaging those kinds of meaning from each other to leave behind the, the cognitive meaning to assess. And it's important in connection to that to bring up value claims. So we'll make claims that certain things are good or bad or better or worse than other things. And notice that value claims, because we're maintaining something that's valuable, we usually have an emotional investment in those types of things. And so we normally will have certain emotive responses about value claims. Nevertheless, though, value claims are the kinds of things that can be true or false. So they do have this cognitive meaning uh, that can't readily be, well, insofar as you, you think that it's got a motive meaning because it elicits emotions in us, um, you can't really tease it out very easily because to do so might, if you were trying to make it wholly neutral, you just might not even be making a value claim anymore. A value claim is going to be charged positively or negatively in, some, in the same way that um, our emotional states, in order for them to be emotional states, need to have a positive charge or a negative charge, like the happiness, joy, um, being content, or whatever emotions we might um, point to have a, a kind of positive charge to them, whereas you know, being angry, being mad, uh, sad, um, anxious, those have a, a certain kind of negative charge to them. All right, but here's an example of, of a value claim that can be true or false. The Beatles football team is better than the Jayhawks. It's true or false, but we are making a value claim. We're saying that one is better. Uh, one is in given a certain kind of criteria, more valuable than the other, or expresses this value better. Um, but notice that we have this, this uh, very natural connection between our emotional states and value claims, and that makes, um, that makes us want to cash out our arguments for value claims in this emotive language. And not only that, uh, value claims can be very difficult to prove. So if we take the example of abortion as morally wrong, it turns out that's a difficult um, subject. So there are philosophers who treat this in a very um, intellectual, argumentative way, but in the, in, the, in the public discourse, it's not. Right? In the public discourse, you can imagine, you probably have heard the various, very strongly emotive language that surrounds uh, the question of whether abortion is morally permissible or morally impermissible. Um, all right, we, you might talk about um, women bodies and you might talk about uh, what women, uh, the, the types of terrible conditions that are associated with uh, illegal abortions and that women will probably turn to that or you might turn um, 
towards the language of babies being murdered and, and things of that sort. And all of those are very emotionally laden. Um, and that's done so uh, because it is difficult to prove this one way or the other. And it allows us to feel safe in our beliefs when we catch it out in the catch our arguments out in this emotive language instead of really trying to pay attention to the cognitive meaning and the, uh, the trying to suss out what the, what the relevant facts are in making a determination. So um, note that even though in a value claim, even though it's difficult and even though uh, we'll usually have some sort of emotional investment with value claims, they are still expressing cognitive information. They're still the kinds of things that can be true or false. We've been talking about cognitive meaning and we've been talking about emotive meaning and how to disengage those from each other. And that way we can focus on the cognitive meaning since as um, people who are interested in argumentative analysis, that's what we're gonna be worried about. But uh, once we tease out that cognitive meaning, and once that's all that we're focusing on, there's still a couple of ways, uh, a couple of more ways in which that meaning can be defective and lead us astray in some ways, or at least lead to confusion. So we need to be able to identify those, and then later on we'll talk about, we'll talk about some ways in which we can resolve um, these defects. So we'll look at vagueness and ambiguity. Vague vagueness as this picture suggests, has to do with blurriness. So sometimes when we use a word or a phrase that picks something out, there's gray areas um, about what should fall under that word, what, what that word should pick out and what that sh word shouldn't pick out. And when you have that, when you have that blurriness, your defect is vagueness. Your language that you're using is vague. Ambiguity, on the other hand, occurs when you have two ways of reading something that is clear. So it's discrete meanings, and there's just two ways or maybe even more, but at least two ways to read something. So here we have this funny sign that says no parking violators will be towed. Um, one way to read this is no parking violators. So people that are parking violators, none of them are going to be, are gonna get towed. So even though you're violating the parking spot or the, the um, parking rules rather, you're not going to be punished for it. You're not going to get towed for it. I, maybe you'll get a ticket, but at least you won't get towed. But what this sign probably really means is no parking space. Violators will be towed. The rule is no parking. Then by, and if you violate that rule, then um, you'll be towed. So there's two discrete ways of reading this, and because of that, it's amb ambiguous. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's look at these in more detail. Let's, let's look at uh, more precise definitions of vagueness and ambiguity, um, and then also look at some examples to give you a concrete feel for what we mean by these. So um, a word or phrase is vague, if it has one possible meaning, but that meaning is indistinct, imprecise, or indefinite. It's got this blurriness to it, okay? So for example, take tallness. What does it take to be tall? Does it, are you tall once you hit six foot? Are you tall when you're over six foot? Um, when exactly, so, so here's another way to think of it. If we brought um, a bunch of people to the front of a classroom um, who varied a whole lot in their height, 
and we bring and we were brought them up shortest to tallest and asked the class to raise their hand when they when the people in the class taking the class thought the person counted as tall and when the person didn't count as tall your the hands that go up are going to uh, they're going to differ right so some people will think will count some people as being tall well before some other people will so there's going to be this grayness this this indecision between us all of when we should count somebody as tall same with bald um, you can imagine that I start uh, not that I need any more help than nature has already given me but you can imagine that I, uh, I start um, plucking out my hair individually um, one by one and then I ask the uh, students in the classroom well raise your hand once you think I'm bald again some people are gonna raise their hand well before I have plucked every single hair off my head and there might be even one person who waits until every single hair on my head has been removed before they're gonna count me as bald and that suggests that when we use the word bald it's it's infected with this vagueness right it's it's vague there's this blurry area of when we should count somebody as being bald or not bald same with rich right? we can take Bill Gates <clears throat> we're all gonna count that person as rich and as we take uh, a penny away maybe we should do it by a dollar since maybe even by a hundred dollars or I don't know, even more since he's got billions of dollars <clears throat> but as we remove these this quantity of money again and again and again some people are gonna raise their hand at him not being rich anymore I don't know well before other people right it, it might be some people might say he's not rich anymore after he doesn't have ten million dollars some people might wait till a million dollars some people might wait till I don't know some other figure <clears throat> but hopefully you get the idea so in contrast with ambiguity a, a word or phrase is ambiguous if it has more than one possible meaning in a given context and those meanings are and this should say discrete And those meanings are discrete. So it's not that the, these meanings are on a continuum in the same way that we had a continuum between um, a whole range of people at different heights or a range of people with different amounts of strands of hair on their head or people with um, difference amount a range of different amount of money so it's not that it's on a continuum like that it's that they're discrete they're they're separate from each other right two different distinct meanings so take the the word bank for instance um, right in in the sign that we saw in the previous slot side that was a statement that could be read in two different ways but here, but amb ambiguity can even affect a single word. So if I say, um, I'm going to go take my money to the bank, it would be odd, but you can imagine somebody going, well, why would you take your money to the side of a river? That's, that's bizarre. Why would you do that? All right, so one way to read that um, statement is to read the word bank as the side of a river as opposed to some financial institution you know where people deposit money and gives out loans and does other other sorts of financial services um, and then there's even bank shots right which gives us another discrete meaning it's not that these three meanings that I've given you lie on a continuum and that sometimes you know that they're that the we're dealing with the same meaning. It's just hard to know where to put um, a particular event in, in whether it should count as a bank or not. 
Rather, these are distinct, completely different meanings that are associated with this single word. And that's why it's ambiguous. All right, so let's look at some examples where the cognitive meaning has some defect to it. And we want to determine whether that defect is vagueness or whether it's ambiguity. So for our first example, it says he was reading a book on the Mississippi River. So take a little bit of time, um, decide whether you think this, it, this sentence is being infected with ambiguity or with vagueness. If you said that it's affected with ambiguity, you're correct. And that's because there's two discrete ways of reading this sentence. He was reading a book while on the Mississippi River, so like on a boat maybe, on the, on the Mississippi River. Or he was reading a book about the Mississippi River and the various kinds of facts um, that surround the Mississippi River. Like I think it's the longest um, river in the United States. So the problem with this sentence is that it's, ambigu it's ambiguous. Let's look at another one. Please stay a safe distance away from the dog. So think to yourself, is this um, ambiguous or is it vague? Is there a problem of ambiguity or vagueness? If you said vague, you'd be correct. And that's because it's not clear what a safe distance is from the dog. Like there'll be some clear cut cases. If I'm on the other side of the world from the dog, clearly that's a safe distance. Or the other side of the universe, clearly that's a safe distance away from the dog. Um, but is three feet a safe distance? Is 10 feet a safe distance? It's not clear between those maybe, get, uh, depending on the case, whether it's a safe distance or not. So this sentence suffers from vagueness. All right. A brisk swim every morning promotes cardiovascular health. Is it infected with vagueness or ambiguity? If you said vagueness, good. And what is vague here is what counts as a brisk swim. How vigorous does your swim need to be for it to be brisk? Right? And how relaxed does it need to be um, to be brisk or to not be brisk? So we, so this sentence um, is infected with vagueness because it's what's going to count as a brisk swim is going to be blurry. Let's look at the last one. Ella kissed James while riding a tandem bicycle. So decide, is this a case of ambiguity or is it a case of vagueness? If you said ambiguity, correct. So there's, and the reason is because there's two ways to read this sentence. One is reading it as Ella kissed James while they were riding a tandem bicycle together. Right? Uh, the other way of reading it is, is something like a drive-by kissing. So Ella um, was riding a tandem bicycle, presumably with somebody else, and then while riding past James, leaned over and uh, kissed him. So these two defects of cognitive meaning, vagueness and ambig ambiguity, can cause us trouble in arguing with somebody or um, in analyzing an argument. And what it can do is it, it can keep us from using the same language uh, as the person that we're having an argument with. Right? And you probably have experienced a situation in which you were in an argument with somebody 
and then it suddenly occurred to you, oh, we're talking past each other. Um, you're saying this thing, and I'm saying this other thing. It's not even that we that we disagree. It's just that we're not using these words in the same way. And when that takes place, <clears throat> you're in, engaging merely in a verbal dispute. Because you don't necessarily disagree on the facts. Um, you're just not using the language in the same way. And that's opposed to factual disputes. If you're using the language in the same way, then you're, you're maintaining that the world, you're dis you disagree with somebody, right? If you're in a dispute, a factual dispute, you're disagreeing with how the world is with that person. I mean, you're, you say it's this way and I say it's this other way and it's mutually exclusive. So let's look at this example and determine whether we think we have a verbal dispute or a factual dispute. So person A says, John takes a lot of pride in his work. He is already a superb craftsman and he is constantly improving. Person B, how unfortunate that John is guilty of one of the seven deadly sins. So take a little bit of time and decide whether you think this is a verbal dispute or a factual, factual dispute and why. If you said a verbal dispute, good. And the verbal, it, the reason why it's a verbal dispute is because the dispute is hinging on pride and what pride means. And there's a couple of senses of the word pride, discrete senses, discrete meanings of the word pride. One is the kind of arrogance, something like arrogance anyway, that the Bible talks about with the seven deadly sins. But there's this other meaning of pride where it has to do with the feeling good about what you've accomplished. And since pride has two meanings, then um, we can get confused if we interpret somebody using one meaning instead of the other meaning. So person A is using the word pride to mean feeling good about what you have accomplished. Whereas person B is talking about, has interpreted A as using the word pride in this arrogant sense, in the sense of arrogance. So here we have merely a verbal dispute and not, not a dispute about the facts. Let's look at one last example. Person A says, amalgamated general corporations earnings were higher than ever last year. You can see this by looking at their annual report. Person B, no, their earnings were really much lower than in the preceding year, and they have been cited by the SEC for issuing a false and misleading report. So take a little bit of time, determine whether you think this is a verbal dispute or a factual dispute. You said this is a factual dispute good that is correct and that's because what they're disagreeing over has to do with what our, our um, amalgamated general corporations earn and the dispute is whether the report is accurate person a thinks the annual report is accurate but b is offering information suggesting that the report is misleading and therefore not accurate. So they're not um, using language in different ways, rather they're disagreeing about uh, the facts of the case. They're disagreeing about how the world really is.